Hi folks, it's Ron. Hey, welcome back to another series of my residential network cabling series of videos I'm putting up. And this is going to be part eight, which is home theater design. Now, you know what? Uh, I'm not going to have a huge conversation here. And uh, uh, home theater design can be a huge to topic if you really want to get into it and uh, can take days and courses. So, uh, but what I'm going to try and impart to you is some basics, I think, if anybody knew that they can make any sound system and video system hopefully look better. And uh, some basic tips of what to think about when you're designing that room and, 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 and getting equipment and how do you hook it up with what type of cabling and that kind of good stuff and kind of what to maybe look out for when you're dealing with all this kind of stuff. Because uh, we all like to have some version of a home theater. Uh, and uh, you know what? You can spend a boatload of money here if you care to. And uh, I mean a boatload. If anybody ever gets you involved in a home theater, you've almost got to ask them up front. What's the budget? Because uh, you can spend every dime or whatever they're thinking of. And you know what? Whether you spend a little bit of money or a lot of money, whatever you have is better than what you had before, so you're happy with it, right? Now, whether it actually sounds like it's supposed to and looks like it's supposed to is a whole other subject. And, uh, you know, a lot of us have never really been exposed to what really good audio sounds like and what really good video actually looks like. And uh, so you just don't know. And, you know, back when I was in fifth grade, I figured nobody could see. It wasn't until somebody realized I need glasses that, you know, all of a sudden I go, oh, well, it make, does make a big difference. So you kind of no, don't know what you don't know. But uh, uh, but we're also happy because, we, what we again, what we have is better than what we had before. Now, uh, we're going to kind of cover a little bit about the, the components that go into that, uh, the cabling you might think about using, uh, not speaker wire, we're talking about, you know, component, composite, uh, HDMI, that kind of good stuff, uh, and a little bit about room design when thinking about setting up this home theater, because that can make a big difference in how this thing's going to sound, and I thought all these websites down below here do a pretty good job explaining basic home theater. Um, that last one, Imaging Science Actually Foundation, uh, is a great little organization if you can ever... Uh, sit down and actually take some of the training they offer is very good and it's not cheap but it's good and it's interesting when we look at the sound system we're going to install uh, in a home theater uh, as a general rule they'll tell you to put a little bit more money into the speakers you're going to put inside them walls than you are the other components because those other components change over time where the speakers are probably going to actually uh, be there for quite a while and you know, for instance the the blu-ray is obviously taken from over from the dvd player kind of thing a good example and you know you can go out and buy yourself a high-end receiver and hook it up to a crap set of speakers and it's not, obviously not going to sound great but vice versa if you take an okay receiver hook it up to a nice set of speakers it should sound pretty good and uh, so the speakers have a lot more to do with the quality of the sound necessarily than the receivers do but uh, um, <clears throat> and obviously it's a combination of the two but it's it's interesting that we'll take put a little more money in speakers now um, do you need to go big dollars here? And the answer to that is, I'm going to say not necessarily. I mean, can you? Oh, absolutely. You can spend big money here. And some people do nothing but spend, again, big money in home theaters, but don't necessarily have to. Uh, but what, whatever speaker you end up buying, make sure that if it's designed to be mounted in a wall, you mount it in a wall. <clears throat> and if it's designed to be mounted in a back box in that wall, then you mount it in a back box. If it's designed to be mounted outside of walls, then you mount it outside of walls. So you'll find that they engineer them for certain applications. So follow whatever that is with the speaker manufacturer you're dealing with. Okay. Now, the room and what's in the room is going to have a lot to do with how this thing's going to sound. And I know a lot of y'all have moved into an apartment and then you know, hear that huge echo in the apartment. And But when you fill it full of furniture, what happened to the echo? And obviously it gets uh, absorbed by anything in the room. So you got to understand that the purpose of the home theater is to make you think you're part of the movie. That's the real purpose of this home theater. And uh, to do that, we'd like to have a dedicated room. And that's why we like a dedicated room, not part of your living room or great room or whatever she, uh, room it is. And so uh, and a lot of times we'll base that room size based on screen size. And obviously on these higher end home theater systems, these guys will put in, you know, 15, 20 foot screens. And um, th that whole room is designed just, again, for that home theater. Now, how close are we supposed to be sitting to a TV today? And that's a good question. And, you know, the answer to that is to keep moving us closer. And, you know, back in the you know, year 2000, for instance, you know, three to four times the width of a screen is typically what you heard. And then a few years later, it was two to three times the width of the screen. And nowadays, I hear people saying about one and a half to two times the width of a screen. And you got to understand, what's the purpose of the home theater? Again, to make you think you're part of the movie. Well, one way of doing that is to fill your vision with the screen. So that's the reason we got you sitting pretty close to them today. And 
On top of that, the resolution in these TVs has gotten so darn good, you can walk right up to one and not see the little dots in them. So it's kind of close, okay? Now, you guys, if, uh, uh, if you haven't heard, rectangular rooms are actually the best sounding rooms. Uh, not L, not round, not, you know, some other shape, okay? Uh, and so they're rectangles. So when you look at uh, almost any home theater, they're going to be rectangular in shape, even the big ones at the, at the movie theaters are. And uh, you got to understand that the sound is bouncing around this room and either being absorbed or reflected throughout the room. And so all sounds are waves, if you don't know this. It's like dropping a pebble in a pond. You get that rippling effect around the pebble. Uh, it's, that's what the sound wave is, is kind of is like in a, in a room. And so um, obviously a hard floor is going to reflect it and, you know, a couch is going to absorb some. And as far as soundproofing rooms are concerned, and it's one of the key things in higher in home theaters we try to do is try to uh, limit that sound into the theater because, you know, these things can get pretty loud. Um, and that can be a very expensive thing if you would really get into it. And you can do some basic things like put it in a, a solid core versus a hollow core door on the room, gasketing that door, uh, doubling up on a sheetrock. Um, 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 and there's all kinds of sound absorption materials that can be had and done. Uh, and some tips to help maybe keep that, that sound in the room. And But here are some things we can do that hopefully will make any room sound better and hopefully look better when you put in that home theater, okay? Now, one of the things that we'll think about, and not always, but are what we call harmonics of the original sound. And uh, as I said a minute ago, all sounds are bouncing through this room. So the first thing you hear from a speaker is that direct sound that comes right to you and hits your ears directly from the speaker. Now, you also hear it as sound that bounces off the sidewall and deflected back into you as well. And that first reflection is referred to as the first order harmonic. Now, it can deflect off another wall too, which would become the second harmonic before it hits your ears. And it can deflect off a third wall before it hits your ears again too. So there's all orders of these different harmonics. And you get beyond the first order, you're kind of chasing it at your tail a little bit because... Uh, most of us aren't going to worry beyond that, and a lot of us won't even begin to worry about this one. But if you did, one way of quickly kind of identifying where some of those problems potentially might be would be to sit in the chair and uh, uh, have a buddy walk down the length of that wall with a mirror in front of them. And they can actually, and when you're sitting in that chair and you can see that speaker you're concerned about in that mirror, right there along that wall would be a good place to think about putting a a sound absorption material or a bookcase or something that might help you know diffuse that that sound coming off that wall but beyond that uh, again we get into some crazy kind of things um, and then when you look at the sound system we're going to install in it now you guys have probably heard of five channel six channel seven channel you know 10.4 whatever the thing might be you're going to understand that virtually all content today is 5.1 all dvds are recorded that way now, you go beyond that to, like, Blu-ray, that gets us six and seven channel options, but uh, uh, be aware that a lot of the content you're going to have is 5.1. And you know what? 5.1 is really fine for most applications. You get beyond that into six and seven channel, you know, hey, you got a little more money to blow. Maybe you got a bit bigger little home theater you're trying to deal with, and uh, uh, there might be reasons why you want to go do that, which is fine. Uh, I, nothing wrong with spending more money if you want to. Uh, but five channel is a lot of it. And so when you look at these numbers, 5.1, five represents the number of surround speakers we're going to put in the in the room. And the one is the number of subwoofers. Now, uh, you can put as many subwoofers as you want into the room, and we'll get into that in a minute or two. But let's look at the five surround speakers. Now, uh, one of the first speakers we might mount in the room is what we refer to as the center channel speaker. And it should be mounted in the very front of the room, what we call dead on with the main listening position in that room. Now, the reason we put it there is because a lot of the content in the movie will come out of that speaker. And virtually all voice conversations are going to come out of that speaker. So it makes you think, again, you're having a dialogue with somebody in front of you. Now, what's the purpose of the sound system? Well, it's just like the video. We want you thinking you're part of the movie. So having it right there in front of you makes you again, you're thinking you're having a dialogue with somebody in the movie. So that's why we put it where we do. Now, um, I mentioned a term there, dead on with the main listening position in the room. Uh, it's interesting, when they sound check rooms to make it sound as good as we possibly can, uh, the engineers can only make one chair sound good. Not all chairs sound great, and a lot of people don't realize this. And so uh, if you ever go into a higher-end home theater store and that salesman guy kind of tackles you at the door, 
walks you into that little room he wants you to experience this theater he's going to sell you, does he tell you the entire room is designed to sound the best and look the best sitting in that chair? And um, many don't. And if you don't do what they did, when you take that thing home and set it up, you're not going to get the same effect that they did inside the store. So be aware of the fact that we can only make one chair sound good. And they call that, by the way, their money chair. Okay? Now... When you look at the other two speakers in the front of the room, the right and left channel up here, you'll find that they're off on a certain angle from that center channel. And that angle is around 22 to 30 degree. Now, where do these angles come from and why are we put them there? And if you don't know, in home theater, speaker placement's kind of critical to get this thing to sound the way it's supposed to. And again, reproduce a live sound. So you got to understand in the 1980s, a bunch of studies are done by these movie guys who are wanting to develop this home theater thing. And again, to be able to recreate a live sound. And in the beginning, sound reproduction was just a single speaker and mono, uh, we refer to it. In the, you know, roughly the 50s, we came out with something called stereo, <laughs> uh, which you got to be standing in between uh, the two speakers in order to get the benefit of that stereo. Uh, and it's interesting, there's a whole study called psychoacoustics, which is how we actually hear as humans. And if you're standing in a sweet spot in a stereo setup, you close your eyes, your eye, your ears will hear a right and a left channel. Your mind, though, will hear a center channel. It's not there. And so when we wanted to develop a sound system that we could re recreate all sounds, or pretty close to it, and we can never get perfect, but we're close, uh, a bunch of studies were done in the, in the 80s. So, you know, they did five, they did 10, they did 20, they did 30 speakers, and they came back and said, you know what? Five speakers in these positions in a room are going to do a pretty good job of recreating live sounds. And so that's why these angles are important, that you put those speakers where they tell you to. Okay? So there's the ones in the front. Now, the ones in the rear, uh, uh, the rear channels we refer to, you'll notice that they're on a side wall, not a back wall, and they're either right at, on the side of you, or they're slightly behind the listening position is what they kind of prefer. And uh, they're never, uh, that's one reason why we never tell you to put chairs on a back wall, because we'd like to put them speakers slightly behind you. Um, uh, uh, okay, and, if, and, if, and by the way, the only reason they're there behind you is to create what they call the flyer effect in a theater. Now, um, in a good quality home theater sound system, you will be sitting in your money chair and you'll hear this thing rumbling behind you. And it sounds like it swished over your head and it disappeared over out into that left channel. Well, that only happens if those speakers are behind you, and that's why they're there. Now, if you are not concerned about the flower effect, and you do need to set these chairs along a back wall, uh, you can actually move those two rear channel speakers up to roughly about a 60-degree angle on the side walls from the center channel, about a 60-degree angle on either side, and uh, they'll sound fine. It's just you're going to lose your flower effect in the theater. So um, a couple things to think about with speaker placement. It's very important that you put the darn speakers where they tell you to, okay? And so make sure they're mounted in the proper locations. And um, uh, I typically tell people never mount speakers in ceilings. And when you put, see people putting these speakers in ceilings, you kind of have a rough idea. They don't know a lot about sound reproduction. And I tell people if our ears were on our top of our heads, we'd be putting them in ceilings. But they're not. It's one of the worst places actually to, to put them. So instead of directing a speaker at somebody, you're you know, kind of pointing it at the ground. So the thing's never going to sound quite like they want it to. And um, so, and they normally do it because they're trying to hide speakers. And you know what? There are all kinds of ways of hiding speakers today. They got speakers today. You can mud right over them, and you don't even know it's a speaker until you lay your hand on the wall and you realize the darn walls are vibrating. So, uh, there are better ways of hiding them. And in some cases, we spend so much money on these things, the last thing we want to do is hide them. So, we mount them on side walls <coughs> or on walls. And the speakers should be mounted at roughly ear height in the room. And if you're sitting in a chair, that's roughly four foot off the ground. And we can mount them a little higher, a little lower if we have to, and tone them down or tone them up if you have to, but uh, that's kind of the, the suggestion. And uh, one of the other key things about these five speakers is that you pull them out of the box and you set them up. Something that's never going to happen uh, unless you adjust it is that all speakers are of the same loudness. They'll be different. And they'll be different based on where they're placed in a room. And uh, for instance, in corners, we typically tell you never put speakers in corners because that, that wall acts like kind of a megaphone on that speaker. And it's a little louder than if it was out maybe by itself. So adjusting the same loudness on each of the five speakers is kind of key because uh, if the speakers in the front are a little loud, uh, the ones in the back, you may not be able to hear what's coming out of those. So we need to set that on all those. So how do you do that? Well, uh, uh, better quality receivers will have sound pressure level 
meters built into them, and those are great. I mean, you basically take a microphone, plug it into the receiver, set the mic in the money chair, and hit the button on the receiver, and it will set each of the speakers for you separately, which is nice if you have it. If you don't, you can go down to you know some shop, a Radio Shack or someplace like that, pick yourself up a sound meter uh, for about 50 bucks. There's not a whole lot of money here. And uh, uh, you can actually download an app on a cell phone, which really isn't much of a sound meter, but uh, uh, probably better than nothing, I guess. Uh, but uh, anyway, what we do is you go home with that uh, sound meter and you crank the receiver up like you want to watch a movie. The receivers allow us to put a test tone on each of the speakers separately. So let's say we put a test tone on the center channel, and it'll be over making a sound at a constant frequency. And um, uh, you'll sit then in your money chair, and then with your meter held at ear height, you'll take a reading of that sound at that position. And let's say the reading comes back at, say, 70 dB of sound. Cool. Then we'll put that same test tone on the left channel speaker, we go back into our listening position, take another reading with our meter, and you want that to, re again, read 70. Now, if it doesn't, you can, through the receiver, raise or lower that one speaker so that it matches the center channel. And then you go through and set all five the same. And uh, you know what? Once you've got that done, uh, I think you're going to be surprised at how much better your sound system actually does sound. Uh, and that is a kind of key thing to make these things sound like they're supposed to. All right? Now... Besides getting those in the right position and making sure they're the right loudness is to mount this subwoofer someplace in, in the room. Now, uh, we call it low frequency effects, LFEs, and uh, subwoofers typically take over about 200 hertz and down in frequency. The human hearing range is around 20 to 20,000 hertz, so that low frequency bass, we need a little bit bigger uh, speaker to actually handle that. So that's what the subwoofers come in and give us all that great bass uh, we hear in these movies that we love. And uh, <clears throat> now the suggestion is that that subwoofer should go to the front of the room, to the left or right of your main listening position. Now, um, I've heard all kinds of opinions about subs. And uh, I've had guys tell you that, oh, no, take the low-frequency bass, the, the subwoofers, and put them in corners and, and basically bounce that low-frequency wave off a corner. Uh, I've had other guys go, no, 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 man, put that, that subwoofer in the money chair and put a test tone in, on it so it's going at a constant frequency, and then walk along the perimeter of the walls in the room. And wherever you hear it good, you can flip to two locations, and if you're sitting in the money chair and it's over there, you should hear it pretty good. And uh, it, I was stunned the first time I was really kind of introduced to this kind of stuff years ago. And um, I took a course lots of years ago, and a, a, a teacher it put a test tone on a subwoofer in the front of the room, and he said, everybody get out of your chair and start walking around this room. And it was a pretty good sized room. But sure enough, you walked a few feet and you barely heard that darn thing. And you walked a handful of feet more and it was loud as heck. So, you know, what's going on? And what the guy was trying to impress upon us was the fact that these low frequency bass waves uh, are very, A, very long. And by the way, they can travel to just about everything. Um, uh, they're the hardest ones to keep in a room. Uh, have a very long, what we refer to as a, a, a wavelength. And so uh, check this out. Uh, here we have a subwoofer here that's going to put out a sound wave, right? And we know sound travels at roughly 1130 feet a second, okay? Now, let's say we put an 80 hertz sound wave on that subwoofer. So we're going to set a constant frequency at 80 hertz, okay? Constant fr uh, frequency. Well, we know that that sound wave is going to travel that far in one second, and it's going to create 80 of these what we call wavelengths, okay? From here to here is one wavelength, okay? Now, uh, and it, it'll create 80 of those in that one second, but what we want to know is how far does it travel just in one wavelength? Well, very simply, you take the distance, divide it by the frequency, and you come up with a number, which is about 14 feet. So from here, which is the face of the subwoofer, to right there is roughly four foot, 14 feet away from the subwoofer. And uh, the next wavelength would be at an end of 28 feet, any continuation of that. Now, if we uh, look at the half wavelength, which is 7 feet here, and then 21 feet, if you happen to be standing at the what we call the null line, where you're 7 feet, 14 feet, 21 feet, or any variation of that, you will barely hear that subwoofer. If you're standing at where there is a peak, and this is roughly 3.5, and, and that's roughly 10.5, and, and any variation of that, you'd actually hear it the loudest. And so uh, be aware of the fact that all rooms will have certain bass frequencies they will have trouble with 
because essentially the width or the length of the room is the same as this frequency or this wavelength. So it's kind of interesting uh, about low frequency bass sound waves. Now, uh, you know the guys with the souped up car stereos and that thing is just a vibrating from all the sound and you're you know 50 feet away from this thing going, dude, how can he sit inside that car? Well, you don't realize that that person is sitting actually pretty close to that sound, uh, that, that source. So uh, they actually don't hear a lot of that sound wave. They feel it, but uh, uh, they may not be, they're actually sitting a little too close to it. So kind of cool stuff, right? So uh, be aware of the subwoofer can technically go about anywhere in the room as long as it kind of sounds good. So with a little ex experimentation with a, a solid tone on your subwoofers and sitting in your money chair, you could probably figure what that is, okay? Now, as far as... Uh, TVs, components that you might want to hook up things with or, or you buy or use. You know, 25 years ago, we had no choice. I mean, CRT, that's it. Cathode ray tube, that's it. Uh, today, I don't know how many times the TVs there are, but they seem like they're bringing out a new one every time I turn around. And so we got the the DLPs, the LEDs, the LCDs, the plasmas, the organic LEDs, and how about those new transparent organic LEDs, not to mention the 4K ones that are coming out. So... Uh, there's lots of choices with the, within TVs, and you can spend actually quite a bit of money in a TV if you care to today. Uh, but uh, there's a few things you should know about them. And one is that all TVs technically should be tuned for the room they're put in if you're going to get it to look the way it ultimately could. And, uh, you know, they never are. And technically, when they make a TV, they typically will crank... Uh, brightness and contrast controls and things like that. So you, when you put them in a sh bright showroom floor, they actually look pretty good. But you put them in a dark at home theater, they could actually be a little too bright. So, um, um, so, so in, in many TVs, by the way, it will come with preset color settings for you. <clears throat> you might look into those, and um, there'll be like a vivid setting and a theater setting and some you know brilliant settings or whatever it might be. Uh, and one of those might get you close to what you're trying to accomplish in that particular room you're in because due to the ambient light and things like that, that room, that TV room got to be tuned for that room. And, um, you know, you could do this by simply watching a movie if you'd like care to, some favorite movie. It has some nice color to it. And as you get to certain spots, pause it and then maybe putz with the colors a little bit. And uh, I'll tell you that to be a little careful with that. But, uh, uh, and by the way, if you ever adjust t colors in TVs, the idea is to turn the TV on and let it warm up for, you know, half hour, an hour. Uh, and they tend to settle down before you start putzing with the colors in the TV. Um, another way of doing this is buy a DVD that's fairly inexpensive, 20 bucks or less. You can throw into a DVD player. It'll put test colors and patterns on screen, and they'll give you like a red film to set the red color and a green to set the green and a blue film to set the blue color. And those are the primary colors we set in a TV. Um, and, um, and actually, the human eye is actually pretty good at setting colors. Uh, and we also set the white and the black levels in a TV. And um, a pro, though, is going to pull out a piece of test equipment that we can actually put test patterns on that screen because the DVD thing and the DVD player uh, set the TV to the DVD player, not some other source uh, like a set-top box or something. Uh, so a pro is going to pull out a piece of test equipment that we put a test pattern on the screen and, again, set all these primary colors and, and again, the black and the white levels. And when they set colors... Uh, in TVs. We do that utilizing what's called the Kelvin temperature range. If you don't know, all colors have a certain Kelvin range that corresponds to that. So if we put a meter on this gal's dress and that meter comes back and it says 6,000 degrees Kelvin, you're pure white and it ain't some variation of a white. Now these little meters can get kind of expensive, but uh, uh, that's what you know, pro is going to do. And you know what? They make a fine living out of doing just setting, resetting colors and audio in, in these home theaters because they tend to come out of whack over time, okay? Now, that's a little bit about the room, a little bit about maybe a TV you might think about as you go to put one in a room. And then we look at the cabling we're going to hook it all up with. And I'm not going to cover speaker wire. I'm going to hold that off on another one. Uh, but I'm going to talk real briefly about component, composite, S-video, and, and, of course, the new one, which is HDMI that we're all supposed to be utilizing. Now, if you have not heard of what's called of the analog sunset, it's actually already set as of last year. And what we're trying to do here is that uh, as in 98, this gets signed into law. Okay, so it's a long time coming. But as of last year, if you if you want to make a device that puts out high def video, and you want to be able to sell that worldwide, that high def video can only go through the HDMI inputs and outputs on the devices. Okay. We can no longer put high-def video out of some other device, like uh, uh, component video. 
And, you know, the Holy Grail today still is 1080p. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we can get that out of component video cable. We don't need uh, HDMI. Always had to pull separate audio, but that's not a big problem. Well, going forward, if, if you're going to go HDMI or, or if you're going to get a high def output, you got to put it through HDMI. And so be aware that we're all being forced into this. So component, composite, everything else is kind of slowly fading away, and we're all going to HDMI. Now that stands for a high definition multimedia interface, is what it stands for. I would encourage you to go check out HDMI.org sometime and uh, do a little research into HDMI. And what you'll find is uh, that we've actually gone through several variations of it since the beginning. And, uh, you know, when HDMI really gets its start in the industry, and I'd go to the trade shows and you talk to f folks and find out what they knew about HDMI, and technicians typically kind of hated it. And, uh, um, and they hated it because of some problems we have with it. And uh, uh, today they love it. <laughs> and I'll explain why in a minute. But the reason they hated it in the past was that uh, when 1.1 versions, and a lot of people don't know there's four versions of HDMI, uh, cables and connectivity, uh, and a lot of it had to do more with the connectivity than the cabling per se, but uh, again, the cables were ready for this kind of stuff too. So 1.1 comes out in the beginning, and it does not do audio. It only does the video kind of stuff. And then 1.2 added audio and video. 1.3 comes out and adds like 18 different little features a, a manufacturer can add to that system, and not all manufacturers used all the features. And 1.4 added Ethernet capabilities to the to the cabling, so we could again the devices, so we could turn the TV into a uh, uh, computer screen. Okay. Well, when you went out and bought equipment, it, the idea was have equipment with all the same version of HDMI in it. Now they're all backward compatible, but <clears throat> excuse me, you might have a TV like that's 1.3 compa compa uh, compatible, but a set top box is only 1.2. So uh, obviously there's t things the TV can do that the set top box can't. So when you went out and bought equipment and you bought a TV or something like that, you know, the salesman on the floor goes, oh, hey, you got three HDMI inputs on the back of that TV. Turn around and ask the salesman, what version of HDMI is it? And they would go, hey, dude, it's HDMI. I don't know what you're talking about. They don't even know there's four versions of it, okay? And again, your cabling was ready for this too, and so very seldom was it blatantly stated. So uh, that was a little bit of a problem. Now, as of September of last year, 2.0 comes out now, um, and 2.0 uh, is interesting. They doubled the bandwidth pretty much, and they did it by changing the encoding schemes that they're utilizing on either end. So it's the electronics that are different, really not the cabling. So as 2.0s come out, it's the same cable, okay? Um, and it's it, it's designed to support the next resolution coming out to us, which is 4K. Uh, which if you haven't heard about that, that's going to be four times the resolution of your 1080p TVs. And these things are not cheap yet, but it uh, gets us out to 18 gigabits of speed to support that 4K uh, resolution video. Now, it, what's interesting about this is the HDMI people are, are not allowing people who make equipment that uses 2.0 um, uh, HDMI connectors and, and stuff in it because... Uh, with 2.0, there's all these other features that could be added to this device if the manufacturer chooses to add that feature. And since not all manufacturers use all these features, uh, that's why they don't want you using the term 2.0 because that's kind of misleading. They're telling us we need to look at the features of this equipment and make sure that those same features are incorporated in this other device we want to make uh, talk to that source material. So uh, be aware of you're looking for features, not these numbers anymore. So when you go out and look for HDMI stuff, what you're going to basically find are two variations as far as the cabling is concerned and even into the connectivity, uh, what we call high speed or standard. And so within the standard group of product, uh, they've got uh, just a standard. They've got uh, an Ethernet version of it, which again turns the TV into a computer screen and an automotive. And in the high speed, we have again the high speed and a version with Ethernet. Okay. Now, again, what's the difference between these? Again, the HDMI standard stuff is only going to get us up to 1080i. Uh, performance is not going to get us up to 1080p. Uh, we have to go to that uh, uh, 1080 uh, high speed stuff to get us up to the. 1080p uh, formatted uh, uh, videos and things like that. So uh, that's the main difference between the two. Okay. Now, um, some cool things go on within HDMI that's never happened in the past. And uh, some of those cool things that goes on is what we refer to as handshake between the devices. 
So the two devices today technically are talking to each other, where so they never did that with component or composite or some other format. And so as these, these two things start talking, there's these encrypted keys, and there's several layers. They have to basically fall into place before this source device is going to release content to this display device. So all these encrypted keys have to kind of fall into place. And that's kind of cool in a way because now the, the DVD player can tell Mr. 1080p TV that, hey, you're going to get a 480p formatted movie, and it kind of knows what to do with it. And they can actually encode information on things like Blu-ray discs that will say, hey, if you see certain things, uh, don't talk to it. And uh, so... Uh, so each device will be, again, talking to each other. And this handshaking, uh, when these two things don't start talking together correctly, because, again, they're not all the same version of HDMI, so to speak, uh, that's all of a sudden when all the, the stuff, the content's not getting released for some reason, or you're getting the audio but not the video, or the video but not the audio, and all these little problems start arising within HDMI uh, connectivity, okay? And what's going on, again, between the two devices. So... Now, the real reason you've been sold HDMI and Blu-ray devices, if you don't know, is something called uh, high bandwidth digital copy or content protection. And a lot of people will call it high definition copy protection or HDCP. So with Blu-ray and HDMI and all this communicating that's going on, we can actually encode, as I said a second ago, information on devices like Blu-ray discs and things like that. that will say, hey, you see certain things, don't talk to it. And you got to understand what's going on with the industry is, uh, you know, we copyright laws are very important, and these folks deserve to get paid. And uh, when you make a copy of something illegally, you know what, they don't get paid. And uh, they obviously want to try and protect their content. Now, back in the 1980s, when there were things on VCR tape, these folks were somewhat protected. Because with a VCR, if I hand you a copy of a video I made, and then you hand to make a copy and hand a copy of that to somebody, and then they make a copy and hand it to somebody, by the time that thing gets recopied, you know, a few times, it's getting to a point the resolution's getting bad enough, you may not actually want to watch the video. Now, when DVD comes out in the 90s, that's digital, and you can make a copy of a copy of a copy, and the last one looks as good as the first one, and shortly after the DVD players come out, DVD burners come out, and you know what? We could easily make copies of all this content that's been put out on DVD. Now, um, um, uh, so we want to protect ourselves this time around, and this is why we got Blu-ray, okay? And by the way, when you make copies of stuff out there, folks, if you don't know it, that's like a $100,000 findable offense for every copy you make. Uh, so don't get in the habit of that. And I always love the younger generation that copies those MP3 files and hand them to people. And you watch out, you can get in trouble for doing that kind of thing. And uh, so today, uh, the Blu-ray player and HDMI and the, the ability to talk back and forth, we can protect our content. And again, as I said earlier ago, we see certain things we don't want to see. They can actually stop releasing the content to that that device out there. So this is why you're being sold HDMI. And, uh, you know, and I wish that's what they would tell you versus the fact that, oh, it's a great experience for you, Mr. Customer, as far as your audio and video is concerned. It's actually a pretty good thing for them. And, you know, no installer ever dreamt up this little connector that we utilize here. And if you ever cut an HDMI cable in half, which nobody does because they spend good money on these things, and there's 19 little wires in those cables today. And so that's not something you're going to easily think about field terminating. And not to mention, um, you you know, it's a bulky cable. It's hard to pull behind walls and, and things like that. So, yeah, no installer ever dreamt up this kind of connector. And it's kind of funny. When I go to the trade shows today... I find the technicians are absolutely love HDMI. And you know why they love HDMI? is because today, uh, if customers are having issues with getting these devices all to work together, not many homeowners are going to sit down and figure out what's going on with this encoding scheme. And they don't have a tool to actually test it either. And today, when I go to these uh, HDMI troubleshooting courses, are absolutely packed. And they're selling some testers and look at quantum data uh, as a manufactured test equipment for that. And that are a couple $3,000 in price. But now we can actually look at that waveform, that HDMI signal, and actually start deciphering what possibly could be going wrong with it. And so the one on the left here is an example of a, what we refer to as a, uh, a good eye pattern. And the one on the right is considered to be an, a bad eye pattern. And uh, uh, so uh, they can start to see what might be potentially wrong with these HDMI signals. So people just absolutely love it. And some other issues you'll run across today, or as far as technicians, they absolutely love it, I should say. 
uh, is that, you know, usually 50 feet or less is the limit on the cabling. We go a little longer usually with, you know, bigger conductor cables, but usually kind of somewhere under 50 feet, it seems to work all right. Um, longer runs than that, we normally convert to some other type of cabling and either, you know, it could be fiber, but, you know, a lot of times it's 5E or maybe CAT6, utilizing what's referred to as a media converter, uh, although these can add issues to that whole signaling thing. And, well, this whole signaling thing is another reason why uh, uh, HDMI doesn't like to get split. We're old component video, you could split it multiple times. Um, look into a new uh, way of doing things, and it's not really new, it's been around in a number of years, called HD base T. And uh, you might look into it, and I saw a demo at a trade show, I don't know, four, maybe five years ago, and they had 100 meters of CAT6 cable, and they were providing 1080p uh, video out to 100 meters across Category 6 out to a TV. And they were actually putting 48 volts DC down one of those pairs, too, and they had an AC to DC converter underneath the TV, and they could actually drive that TV with that uh, Category 6 cable as well, which I thought was really cool. Uh, so look into it. Uh, and then um, if you have not heard about uh, 802.11 AC wireless systems, that's new as of last year, too. Uh, and that provides us with gigabit uh, wireless speeds. And streaming high-def video requires roughly a gig of bandwidth. And uh, if we could all do this wirelessly, uh, uh, we're not having to send the wires, I tell you what, that might really be a game changer moving forward as we get into uh, um, future versions of uh, home theater systems. So anyway, that's a lot of little things that you might think about with home theaters. Uh, um, you can find all kinds of little uh, outlet boxes and uh, low voltage boxes. We might want maybe low and one high here to run cabling behind walls we want to. Uh, they even have these with power modules in them so you can mount all that behind the TV and mount the TV right on the wall in the face of that. Uh, you'll find all kinds of uh, uh, TV mounts out there today. Uh, which we normally are mounting to a wall, but not always. Uh, you don't see as many TVs on pedestals as you want to. And again, there's all kinds of wire mounts out there. But again, those are all little things you might think about, you know, what type of room you want to use, the carpeting, the home theater chairs. And I'm telling you, this can get into a deep subject, depending on how much money you really want to spend. But with those tips, hopefully you'll be a little bit more armed when you go to tackle that next little home theater project you're thinking of. And again, folks, I appreciate you watching the channel. I really do appreciate you all subscribing to that channel. Again, I'm Ron, and I'll plan on seeing you on the next one.